Namaste and welcome to the audience in this brand new episode of our program Guest in Town, Aditi Debo Bhava. It's me, your regular host Rohan Shrestha and today we are going to focus on this reconstruction and recovery of the earthquake affected area of Nepal. And for this, in our studio, we have former CEO of uh, Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority and he is Roser Sitan. Let me welcome him. Welcome, sir. Welcome to Nepal. Welcome to Himalaya Television. It's a pleasure to be here, Rohan. Mm -hmm. Tell us something about this visit of yours. So I had this job of trying to mm -hmm. reconstruct my own city, my own region after the big earthquakes we had. And during that time, I had that job for nearly four years. No one came to me and gave me any advice on how I should think about how to recover, how to run this recovery organisation. Mm -hmm. So I've got various Nepalese friends and they're all keen for me to come here and share my lessons with, with your leaders. Mm -hmm. So I've been here for the last week or so talking about okay, my when did lessons. You come? Last I, week. A, a week ago, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. New Zealand also went through the devastating earthquake, which was, I guess, 7.8 Richter scale. Tell us something about the condition of uh, New Zealand right now. So, I mean, New Zealand's a small country, mm -hmm. um, about the same land area as Nepal, um, but only four and a half million people. Um, so, it's a much so we, we're much more spread out. This latest earthquake, the 7.8, which is a big earthquake, that actually happened in a very isolated area, mainly farmland, very few buildings very few high buildings so unfortunately it has killed two people but it hasn't caused the, the same level of devastation mm -hmm. that happened in the earthquakes that happened in my city Christchurch five or six years ago. Okay you led uh, five or six years it, it was in 2010 I guess isn't it? 2010 and then there was a nuts some more in 2011 <laughs> so we had a whole series of earthquakes one after another in our Earthquake city. prone area. Yeah, although well, before the earthquakes, mm -hmm. we didn't think it was earthquake prone. And mm -hmm. suddenly we just started having these enormous earthquakes. Uh -huh. So very unsettling. You led the reconstruction and uh, recovery. Uh, it was from uh, this uh, Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Center, uh, Recovery Authority. Tell us something about it. What was the mandate of that uh, CREA, C-R-E-A, isn't it? Tell us something about it. So uh, my job was to... Um, coordinate the overall recovery. Right. Mm -hmm. So we You're had the CEO. I was the CEO, so I reported directly to um, the government minister. Um, and my job was to try and bring everything together and make the recovery happen. Mm -hmm. It's been six years of that 2010 massive destruction. Tell us something about how New Zealand revived. You know, New Zealand is a comparatively rich country, you know, um, a democracy. But still, I can't say all roads, all houses are fixed. There's still many houses, most roads, you know, things take a long time. And people have become, people are impatient and it will take, while it's taken five or six years already, it will probably take another five or six years for many things to get fixed. It just mm -hmm. takes a long time. And one of the things I, I learned that was you have to try and be honest about the time frames. Because if you are honest with people about how long things are going to take, then people, if they know it's going to take three or four years for their house to be fixed or to get something else fixed in the area, they can perhaps make other plans. Mm -hmm. So we learned the hard way, leaders need to be as honest as possible about how long and difficult these recoveries are. Mm -hmm. Did you go to some earthquake affected area of Nepal this time? I did. So I've been out in some of the countryside mm -hmm. where people have actually um, areas where people have lost all their houses. How did you see the condition? Um, people, people are often living in quite difficult conditions. Um, I visited an area where World Vision... Right. Saku, I guess. Saku, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so there were some World Vision mm -hmm. engineers who were saying they want to get the 307 houses repaired there within the next year, and that sounds hard to me. But I also do things like I met a, a, school, um, a school headmaster, the guy who runs a, a local secondary school, mm -hmm. and he, he, he was tired. And I guess... Tired in a sense? Tired. He was exhausted already. Mm -hmm. You know, he's lost his school. He has many right. issues. Mm -hmm. And you just saw almost a weariness about him. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing in Christchurch, that you can be the, the, the government leaders in our fancy suits and our fancy cars, but often it's the people out in the community, the people who run our high schools, the people who run our health clinics, they're the people that we also, those leaders we also need to support to make sure they can stay strong and healthy. So in three or four years when things are still needing to be fixed, they are still strong leaders able to look after their communities as well. How do we analyse our uh, leaders' policy, or let's say uh, the policy for the reconstruction? You're the, the, you're the policy of your reconstruction? Right. I mean, it's, it's difficult for me... While you visiting the Saku, how did you feel? I mean, I felt that many of the people were positive and happy, but I think many of them also are, are impatient. They, 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 they want to see things happen as soon as possible. 
Um, and, you know, meeting with the senior leaders from the NRA, they are also keen for things to happen as soon as possible. But these recoveries, they're complex, hard things, and it just will take time. Still, we have not been able to, you know, attend the goal of reconstruction. It's still, people have been remaining under the tent. So how do you see? Well, I mean, it's, it's very, very frustrating for those people. Mm -hmm. um, and for those people in those communities, they need to know how long it's going to be before they get proper houses. Um, if people are going to help rebuilding those houses, we need to start training those people now so as much local resources can be used. Um, I think sometimes in these events, we can sometimes see we want perfection. But perfection is really the enemy of the good. You know, get on with and get some things happening as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, there's a slogan, you know, build back better. Right. And I think sometimes the better almost needs to be in brackets. You know, we want to build back better, but sometimes we have to give a little bits so we can get some things going more quickly. And the people whose housing situations, for example, are the most desperate, we should try and get to them as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. That place is just an example of that earthquake affected area. How do you analyze the overall process since you met with different leaders of Nepal as well as including Sushil Gyawali who is uh, heading the reconstruction authority in Nepal. How do you see the overall reconstruction process going on in Nepal? Oh, I met a lot of people who are very passionate about okay. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. whom, did you, whom did you meet with? So I, I met most of his, uh, his, his management team, some of the other un under secretaries. So I met a number of his, of his key leaders as well. Um, I also met people from your universities who have been involved mm -hmm. and, and some of the other institutions. Um, but I mean, in Christchurch, 18 months after the big earthquake, you know, very few houses had been fixed. Right. It's still, you know, gathering the resources to, to build back houses that are stronger than we were before, it takes time. And that's incredibly frustrating for people. But the thing is that we have not been able to start. So, I mean, in Christchurch... We're Don't you feel that when you visited Saku? Um, I mean, the people, the Nepalese people are such a wonderful people. Mm -hmm. They're so positive and friendly. Um, so, I mean, I didn't spend long enough for them to really get the true story about how those people are feeling. And some of those people also, the people that are feeling the worst, often have the quietest voices as well. So that's one thing you learn. You need to make sure you get out as far away from the cities as possible into the real backcountry. Because often those people whose communication is the poorest, whose lives are the, most, are the most difficult. The leaders need to make sure they get out into those sort of places. And, and from what I'm hearing, the NRR, NRA people are getting out and talking to those people as well. Mm -hmm. I want you to share your experience in New Zealand because New Zealand also went through this devastating crisis. And how did you manage to uh, do all these kind of things? I mean, I, I tried getting out and talking to um, other government leaders to make sure they were actually on the same page. They understood the urgency and the need to be coordinating our activities. But we also need to make sure you go out and talk to the people as well. Mm -hmm. The people who are most affected, the people out in the areas where support was going to take, going to take the longest. And just ask them the very simple questions about what are, the, what, what, what are there a few basic needs that would make a real difference in their lives. Mm, the grassroots people. The grassroots people. And sometimes their needs are much more modest than you might expect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we talk about communication is about the leaders talking, but in many cases in these events it's also about leaders listening as well, mm -hmm. going out and hearing what those, what, those, what those leaders needed. You know, I tell a story at one stage about six months after the earthquake, taking some of the most senior government officials, the people who ran the Treasury yeah. and the Prime Minister's Department, out to some of the worst affected areas. And and as I came out of one of some of these houses had been badly damaged, someone driving past saw me and got out of his car and just started abusing me, mm -hmm. saying it was all too slow. Abusing, <laughs> abusing in you, in a sense? Yeah, saying, Roger, you are hopeless. It is all taking too long. What are you doing with these men in suits? Mm -hmm. Get out there and fix something. We don't need men in fancy suits. And it was a good thing because these other very senior government leaders had never been spoken to like that before. And for them to get in their faces was, it was a very good thing and make them realise about they need to get out there and get on with some things. Mm -hmm. Lots of problem, problem arises uh, in the way of this reconstruction. Like today Nepal is facing the problem of uh, you know, how to channelise the money or let's say how to channelise the amount and whom to give, how to do all this kind of stuffs that Nepal government is facing. Do you think that these are the genuine problems that comes in the way of uh, reconstruction? 
Well, they are genuine problems. And you what kind of problems did you face in your country? Um, we, we had basic problems of sometimes just having enough construction materials. Mm -hmm. Having enough construction train... Construction materials. Construction materials, mm -hmm. cement, wood, uh, metal, so, you know, steel beams. So we had shortages of materials. What about identifying the victims? Um, because in Nepal today, it has become the major problem. Who is the actual victim? There is a big question mark. How can we adopt or how can we manage for that? So in general, in a general sense, we did know who the victims were. But we did find over time that some of our victims had very quiet voices. They didn't speak up. Mm -hmm. So in the, end, in the end, for the worst affected areas, we actually went door to door, knocking on doors with people like the Red Cross and people from local churches mm -hmm. to find out who had particular needs we needed to meet. And some of those programs aren't, don't sound very exciting, they're not very spectacular, mm -hmm. but you have to actually get out into the field and go and ask these people, what do they need? And for some of these people whose houses have been ruined, it was simply about getting a, a hole fixed in the roof yeah. so the water didn't come through, uh, making sure the door would lock at night. Simple fixes that made a big difference to people's lives. Mm -hmm. So this kind of problem we... So, yeah, so, so many of these solutions, while the government will have a role, getting out and talking to the people, it was also about the government simply giving a mandate to other people like the Red Cross, like church groups, giving them small amounts of money to get right. some of these very mm -hmm. simple programs going. So, you know, sometimes fixing a problem, we might think it would cost this amount of money. For some of these things, the amount of money is actually quite small and can make a huge difference to many people's lives. But you can't have a disaster as big and as complex as what you've got or what we had without many mistakes being made. So you need to try different ways of supporting these people. Some of them will work and some of them won't work so mm -hmm. well. But you need to learn lessons, you need to reflect on those lessons and then you need to move forward. Mm -hmm. We just said that you had a meeting with uh, different leaders as well. How did you analyze, maybe you have gone through the policies that the Nepal government has drafted for, for, for the support of this uh, earthquake victims? Did you go through and how, what is your comment on it? So, I mean, I've only been able to look at your, your, your plan from a most high level. And really for me, the person who's only been here a week, it's hard for me to give a real critique mm -hmm. and criticism right. because, you know, I'm just here mm -hmm. so new and it'd be, uh -huh. be silly. But I think the overall structure of, what you're, of the order you're doing things makes sense. My, 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 the, if I'd give you one bit of advice is start getting some of the reconstruction going as quickly as possible in the worst affected areas and then start learning the lessons of how you then do it in other areas, take those lessons into other areas over time as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think that we have not been able to start the reconstruction process? I mean, once again, I mean, you are such a big country <laughs> with so many complex problems. Um, I, I think, I think you, there are many people who are ready to start working now mm -hmm. in many of those affected areas for the different, you know, not for, for the different INGOs and other local groups. Give them some resources now and give them a mandate to start but learn lessons as they, as they, as they make mis mistakes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of problems did you face? What kind of challenges did you face? And how did you uh, mitigate them? Well, one of the problems was we wanted to build back things often exactly as they were before. And sometimes it was better to build back things slightly smaller than they were before and they come back more quickly. Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, we joke we have two religions. We have the religion of Christianity, right. where we had mm -hmm. a, a huge, and, and the religion of rugby. We play you know, rugby football. And for in our, we had a very big cathedral in the middle of our city, which, which fell down. And fixing it is, if we do decide to fix it, is going to take you know, many years and $100 million. So instead we built a temporary, much smaller cathedral for less than one-tenth of the that cost. That is a temporary. Is that we call it a temporary one. Mm -hmm. But it's been very successful because it's given somewhere, somewhere where people can pray and worship. So doing things smaller, slightly smaller and quickly has been a very good How thing. How was it built? It was built out of wood and actually cardboard. Okay, cardboard and the wood. Cardboard and wood. Uh -huh. And we had, we had a Japanese architect who came and helped, me des helped us design and build it. But don't you think that the use of cardboard and wood has uh, uh, ruined the importance, the historical even, uh, importance of that church? So our church that fell down, our, our beautiful cathedral, where I was married in, mm -hmm. it was made out of stone. Okay, uh -huh. it was made, it was of, ma stone. made of stone. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding it in stone, people are nervous that if we build another stone one, it will fall down. So if we're going to rebuild it in stone and make it stronger, that will be expensive and take a long time. 
which is why we decided to build it out of other materials which are much, more, which are much stronger for earthquakes. So there has been some, you know, quite a lot of discussion about you know, how to rebuild the permanent one, but we know that building it out of these, you know, these, the wood and cardboard has allowed us to get something back going more quickly. So are you planning to rebuild it using stone? So that's still a discussion which is going on in the community. <laughs> Okay. And I'm part of that discussion because I'm part of that church group. But it's still a discussion we, we, we need to complete on how to rebuild it. But we, we also put What is your opinion as the general public? What should be done? Well, so I mean, the, the public are split. Some people say we should rebuild it in wood, and some people say we should re rebuild it in so no one, no, there is no, there is no mm -hmm. consensus. And the politicians have been a little bit reluctant to become involved because they know there's no winning answer there. Mm -hmm. They will upset somebody whichever way they, they, they go. Mm -hmm. But so we, we also have a rugby stadium. Right. I said we have, we have, we have two, we have two, we also have this religion of rugby. And we built a temporary rugby stadium in a 100 days that seats, I think, 18,000 people. So smaller than the one we want to build, the beautiful one, but actually allowed us to go and watch this favourite game of rugby quite mm -hmm. quickly as well. Okay. How can we, Nepal, focus on this reconstruction process in the points? Well, I mean, you have some big goals of rebuilding every house within, I'm not sure how many years. Mm -hmm. But you should have some immediate goals as well that people feel are actually achievable. So I think the number of houses you need to rebuild is something like 800,000, some mm -hmm. number like, some huge number like that. Get a goal going within each region of a number which you think is genuinely achievable, then achieve that. Because unless you people start seeing some targets are achieved, people become very cynical about whether that long-term target will ever be met. Set some small targets, give resources to those people to get those, to get those um, houses rebuilt, and then learn the lessons of which, why, what lessons you learnt so as you make that project bigger and you continue to build houses, take those lessons so you can learn from those, from those mistakes. Okay. So how can we prioritise the sector? I mean, I, I mean, it's hard for me, all the way from New Zealand, to tell you how to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think about the people who are going What through. did you do in New Zealand? How did you so pri what, prioritize the sector? We largely didn't, because the reinsurance companies paid for the rebuilding of all the houses. Mm -hmm. So it was really up between the insurance companies and the customers to get their house to work out who was going to get done first. But in many cases, it was actually the people in the worst off houses who got done last, mm -hmm. because we weren't sure how we we're going to rebuild houses on, that, on those uh, in the areas where the land was very, very damaged. Mm -hmm which sounds crazy. We, we, Christchurch is built on a swamp. Uh -huh. So after the earthquake, the houses in the worst years f almost <laughs> fell, into, right. f fell, fell into a swamp. And reworking out how to rebuild mm -hmm. houses on that swampy ground was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And that took a long time. So people in those areas became very, very upset by how long the rebuild was, was taking. Has people become aware? Well, pe people, people, were, people became angry that there were no designs on how to rebuild these houses. Mm -hmm. And we had to say, be patient. Designs on how we can use steel and cement and all these other ways to make the house strong enough to survive on this swampy ground, it simply took a long time. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, tell us something about uh, the awareness level of the general people in New Zealand uh, about uh, reconstruction and recovery after this, since you gave the example of this uh, using of uh, cardboard in the construction of uh, the uh, monument, isn't yeah. it? There is a half, half people say, okay, it is fine, and half people say, we have to revive or we have to reconstruct it using the stone. What about the house, houses in New Zealand? So, uh, a lot of the houses... What kind of houses were built? So, prior to the earthquake, we had houses which were brick, and had heavy tile roofs, and they really, people realised they didn't perform well in the earthquakes. So building houses with much lighter materials became the thing to do, and that took some time for people to realise that was actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. So those new construction techniques are much more better in now, but it took time for people to believe that was a good thing. But also we had some more, after, as people started rebuilding those houses, the people who built the houses with the new materials, they saw those houses perform better. They didn't crack, they didn't break apart. So then people's experiences were, gee, these new materials are superior to the old ones we were using. What kind of new materials that should be used? Well, they were simply, we made the houses out of timber. Mm -hmm. um, we made them out of timber. Wood. Wood. Mm -hmm. Lightweight roofs made out, made out of roofing iron rather than, the, rather than the roofing tiles and rather than bricks on the outside of the houses or stone. Um, so those lightweight materials have been much much more effective.
-hmm. but it takes time for people to actually accept those new, new technologies. Those, those, right. those, those but new the, technologies are a good thing. But the question is that uh, in the name of doing reconstruction, we have to preserve its cultural uh, site as well. We have to look after the cultural site as well. Since Nepal is uh, Nepal or Kathmandu, let's say, is itself a cultural city. So how can we preserve culture as well as do reconstruct? I don't have a simple answer to that. Mm -hmm. But are there construction techniques with uh, some of those monuments? look very similar to the way, the way they were before, but have got, say, steel reinforcing on the side to make them stronger. But all that, you know, you need to have a proper discussion with the, your key leaders in the community about what is acceptable. But in, in where we came from, we really decided we didn't want monuments that were going to fall down if we had another earthquake. Monuments were going to, that, that were going to th threaten lives. Mm -hmm. You know, but our, our church, our rugby stadium are all examples of things you can do quickly that allow people to get their lives back on right. track, mm -hmm. but aren't exactly the same as they were before. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you see the role of the people, the general public, in reconstruction, in recovery? So in our city, many of the public, um, many of the young people learnt new skills. Mm -hmm. Many of them didn't have you know, good jobs before in the new earthquake Zealand. in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So as a result of the earthquake, they got new jobs, they got jobs as builders, um, as people putting roofs on houses. Mm -hmm. They learned a whole lot of new skills. So while New Zealand has been through, or my region has been through this terrible destruction, good came out of it and people actually got proper jobs, new skills, and they can now go on and carry on getting work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go through these different phases in an earthquake. It brings the new opportunities as well. It does bring new opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. You need to take the time in this reconstruction to make sure you do train your young people up with these new skills so they can, you know, continue to prosper. Mm -hmm. and, and grow. Okay. At last, if you want to say something in one line to our general public or the leaders of Nepal. With the wider community about what's going well and what's going badly, they need to learn from their mistakes and they need to be humble. Mm -hmm. If they make mistakes, they need to um, acknowledge them and apologize. But the public also need to know that these jobs, you know, it's a very, very big job these leaders have and they will need support. But not just the leaders and the government jobs will need support, but also the leaders out in the community. Right. You need to work, how to learn, how to support them. And even the general well. public. You'll need to learn to support those, the most vulnerable of those people as well. Too. Are you optimistic or not? Since I am optimistic. I am optimistic. Mm -hmm. You come from the most beautiful, beautiful country. Well, thank you so much, sir, for your time and your valuable opinions. Thank you very much. Thank you me. so much. Thank you. Thanks to you as well, the audience, for your time to stay with us for more news and entertainment packages. Keep watching Himalaya Television. Namaste. Thank you.